the end of December, we heard about this outbreak uh, in, in Wuhan, China. I thought nothing of it. Maybe like 40 people had pneumonia. Of course, we didn't know what we know now that there is a big pandemic. It was January 6th, I was snowboarding. My wife and I flew to Italy in February 10th. We were visiting in the Siena Cathedral. I have blurry vision around the first two months of this. My assumption was that if it wasn't influenza, it was probably a coronavirus, which we study in our lab. We saw this virus spreading quite rapidly. It really like, made all the alarm bells go off. Going through a vaccine development program uh, requires a thousand decisions and a thousand things to go right. When something like this happens, you immediately start to contact each other. When I got a call from Dr. Barney Graham. Get ready to get back in the saddle. Hey, did you see this? And I immediately texted Daniel. Three in the afternoon, so I'm sure I was in lab. I got up, I went to my computer. We got so busy so fast. The pandemic just marched toward us. I started to email our um, collaborators. We had to launch our full response team during that time. And complete pivot to working on SARS-CoV-2. We didn't have reagents, we didn't have blood samples from survivors, we didn't have anything, but we knew we needed to launch, so we did. Our team pulled together and started the process. When we first heard this, we thought, that's silly, that, that can't ever be done. This type of work takes years. I think in the last decade, we perfected a process in which we can make antibodies in about six to 24 months. But the more we thought about it, we thought, well, we, we probably can go quicker than we go now. And so with our team, we started a stopwatch, we did a simulated epidemic, when we went as fast as we could, and we got the whole discovery process done in about 78 days. Of course, we had 20 years of fundamental research about the human immune response that we were using as a basis. So we knew we could speed up the process. The first known case in the United States walked into an urgent care in Seattle, Washington on January 19th and we had to pivot and we did the real exercise to do discovery of antibodies for COVID. The blood sample became available on a Saturday evening. We were able to contact the CEO of FedEx who contacted his team and were able to move the sample with a GPS tracker overnight into Memphis. One of the company folks drove in a Lincoln Town Car to my home in Nashville, Tennessee and handed me on a Sunday morning the sample and I rushed off to work. So the sample was actually about two days old by the time we got it, and we were so excited to get it into the lab and start working, but when we looked at the cells under the microscope, they were not alive. And then we started brainstorming a little bit, and we realized that the genes for the antibodies that we were seeking were still in the tube. So we sequenced the RNA and DNA that was in the blood tube and made a library to decode the recipe for all of the antibodies there. We needed to move so quickly in this instance that we could not rely on our usual techniques. So we turned to a next generation sequencing, supercomputing and bioinformatics and artificial intelligence, and single cell biology in which we were testing individual cells from human bodies one at a time, but doing that in thousands. And we had to do this work under very uncertain circumstances. Many of the scientists were working uh, as many as 20 hours a day. Once we identify sequences that are interesting to us, that's just letters on a computer. We need to physically make the DNA and we use instruments that can synthesize the DNA. It's like a desktop printer. We put in a code and DNA comes out that we can use to then make antibodies. So we obtained blood samples in March. 
And about 24 days later, we were able to pass on the recipe for the cure, the DNA sequences of antibodies that we discovered to a pharmaceutical partner who could do the manufacturing. Of course, we want to do these things quickly, but also safely. So they were testing the materials they had manufactured for several months, working with the FDA to ensure they were safe. And by August, they were using the antibodies that we had started making in March. So that, that period was very, very compressed and rapid, but still we went through all the required steps to be safe. And uh, now we're into what are called the phase three trials, which are the efficacy trials to see how well these molecules will work to prevent and treat the infection. Often people wonder, haven't we exhausted the number of studies that we can do on something like the immune system? I think the more we learn, we, we sort of are just chipping away at the edges and we see there's so much we don't understand. Medicine, therapeutics, prevention, vaccines, they all grow out of the curiosity of how the world works, which is discovered through basic science. We really had a nice breakthrough around 2012 uh, when I was able to determine the crystal structure of the RSV fusion protein. Xavier Salens, who's our colleague at Ghent University, reached out to him uh, because he was interested in using that protein to immunize llamas. Uh, it sounds weird to say it with a llama. And because he was able to design specific mutations into that protein, he was able to stabilize it and make it a much better vaccine immunogen. I was snowboarding with my family in Park City, Utah, when I got a call from Dr. Barney Graham, and he let me know that he was talking with the CDC, and it looked like the virus that was causing pneumonia outbreaks in Wuhan was a, a beta coronavirus. I remember getting a WhatsApp message from Jason saying that there's a novel beta coronavirus in China and that we're going to try and put a rush out and determine the structure and hopefully work towards developing a vaccine. But to be honest, at the time, I, I thought nothing of it because maybe like 40 people had pneumonia in Wuhan, so I didn't think it would become a global pandemic. That's when the rush sort of started. We were getting tons of emails from Barney and Kizzy saying, can we introduce these mutations into the new spike? Can we get the genes ordered? Can we start to express protein and see what it looks like? These molecules are like transformers. They start off in one conformation. When it encounters our host cells, it then undergoes this really dramatic change where it kind of explodes up the top shoots part of itself into our own cell membranes and then refolds and bends back around into this other conformation called the, the post-fusion shape. Llamas, in addition to producing more conventional antibodies like you or I would produce, they also produce these smaller antibodies which are called nanobodies. A full nanobody is about half the molecular mass of a conventional antibody. The reason why that's interesting to us is because it tends to make the nanobodies more stable and it also tends to allow them to bind into small nooks and crannies that larger antibodies wouldn't be able to access. Basically, an antibody treatment or a nanobody treatment could be administered to somebody who is already sick to try to reduce symptoms and fight off infection more quickly. So our plan was to send Xavier prefusion stabilized spikes from SARS and MERS and then they would immunize Winter the Llama to try and isolate these single nanobody that was capable of binding many different spikes from many different coronaviruses. And then the idea was to have this one nanobody that we could potentially have on hand, we could stockpile, and it would work against all known coronaviruses as well as coronaviruses that had not yet emerged into the human population like SARS-CoV-2. Technically, we did fail at our initial goal of trying to isolate the single nanobody that can broadly neutralize many different coronaviruses. But we're still able to identify the one nanobody that seems to have good reactivity against SARS-like coronaviruses. These are experiments that we've been performing for years now. 
but because we've been doing them for so long, we've gotten really good at them to the point where a sequence was released online and within weeks we had an atomic resolution structure of that protein, which was then going into vaccine trials. So I think it's an excellent example of why we have to fund basic science broadly and begin researching different pathogens because we don't know which ones are going to ultimately break out and lead to a pandemic. When a pandemic breaks out, that's not the time to start years of research on that pathogen. You need to do it ahead of time. Our goal was go fast, organize, and be able to go into phase one clinical trial in 100 days. And obviously we uh, exceeded that expectation and goal with 66 days. Most of what really prepared me and us really is the work that even started before I got to the Vaccine Research Center around SARS and MERS and how we might make the best vaccine for a, a, for a virus that might be akin to those two viruses. We'd studied how to make the vaccine design. We'd studied the type of platform that we might want to deliver that vaccine design. And so when it became clear that, that was, it was time, um, everyone just essentially dropped everything else that we were doing um, in our small team. We've gone through this drill a few other times, trying to get our vaccines into the field in time to get an answer uh, before the outbreak waned. MERS. Ebola. Zika. SARS. Nipah virus. Uh, during that period of 2014 to 16 or so, uh, we we're working on the structure of spike protein, again with uh, Dr. McClellan. Finally solving the structure of the endemic coronavirus HKU1 allowed us to see the structure well enough to start designing stabilizing mutations, and that was done and published in 2017. And those stabilizing mutations are the basis for our work during this coronavirus outbreak. So my interest in emerging infectious viruses is particularly what are the steps which facilitate this transmission from, for instance, like ducks or dromedary camels or bats into the human population. We're now a married couple for quite some time already, but we are very complementary to each other. We did this work together, but Vincent's main thing was the vaccine. Um, and my lab's main thing was antivirals, actually. With MERS coronavirus, we um, started working on some animal models, which are really important. We were actually the first um, people to establish an animal model. And by doing like field research in the Middle East, uh, in Qatar and Jordan, that gave us a lot of expertise in working with coronaviruses, vaccine development, which really made us like in the right position to start working when SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 came along. We were able to provide the world with the first basic information on, on this virus within 11 days and a breakthrough speed, I would say. Yeah. After the experience with Zika, we uh, developed a plan for us to do what we call a prototype pathogen approach to uh, pandemic preparedness. And that, all that work helped put us in a position to, to have a better design for this vaccine that we're developing now. Early in January, we already decided if this really turns out to be a coronavirus and we can get the virus, these are the things we do. So there was already a plan. So the next three days after the sequence came out was really around organization. So we were ordering mice, we were ordering DNA plasmids, we were starting to think about how we would optimize different assays, the pace at which we are going. It was very intense. We did, we did come in. As well. So that allowed us to quickly move and we had uh, clinical grade quality uh, material back from Moderna within 41 days or 42 days after the sequences were released in a crisis like this and try to save days as much as we can because those days add up. 
all of these laboratories coming together to make one solid thing. It's happening now because every single scientist, especially in the world, wants to make sure that we get through this. And I think it's very clear that science is the only way that we will. I've always enjoyed solving problems. I think part of that came from our work on the farm. We had to solve problems every day just to get through the day. Science became a passion of mine in elementary school even. When I was a kid, I loved just collecting things, especially seashells. I loved the patterns and the forms. I think that's the first time I understood my passion for biodiversity, which became really my career. It's hard to have freedom if you don't acquire your own funding. Fortunately, we had funding from the National Institutes of Health showing that we can greatly facilitate our response to a pandemic by having already done much of the research in prior years. I think the diversity of funding is important. Those dollars are often paid back much more than what was paid in. 